only two verses. If my people's hearts are humble. It's a familiar tune. If the word, if the song sounds like it's not, the tune is familiar. So let's sing together. If my people's hearts are humble. 805. Tell us wherever two or more are gathered, then you're there as well. I pray that you bless this service this morning, draw us close to your presence. That you also tell us that, Lord, a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without you knowing about it. All the hairs of our head are numbered. Lord, you've provided with us, you've provided for us in, in so many ways. I pray that you, that you help us to use what you've given us, Lord, in this offering to, to honor your name. Pray that you would bless this offering this morning. Help us to do the work that you have carved out for us to do. Help us to seek your face. May your will be done. I pray all this in Jesus' name.
If you did not, as the children are leaving, if you did not uh, hear some of the comments made at the National uh, Prayer Breakfast uh, this past week, then you need to you need to find them. I'm sure you can find them on the internet somewhere. And you need to you need to hear what was said. A certain individual likened ISIS to the Christians in the Crusades, and that shows an ignorance of history. Number one, uh, I don't liken what Christians did in that period of time to ISIS. That's for sure. We're we're dealing with an enemy, folks, that is just ruthless, savage, beastly. I'm telling you, wake up, America. Wake up before it's going to be too late to wake up. I had the privilege to attend the National Prayer Breakfast uh, some years ago. In fact, the key speaker on that particular occasion happened to be Dr. Ben Carson. Anybody here know Dr. Carson? They don't even know who I'm talking about. He's a foot doctor down in Lando. <laughs> he was head of neurosurgery at the Mayo John Hopkins. And I heard him speak that day, and I was just awed by him. And I later saw the movie. If you haven't seen the movie on the life of Dr. Ben Carson, grew up in Chicago, you need to see that movie. It's worth... Uh, it's worth purchasing or renting or doing whatever you have to. I promise you it's an inspiration. I remember a few years ago I had a young <clears throat> young black boy that had gotten into some trouble. And he had this, uh, this white lady counselor who was trying to help him. She came to court with him. And uh, I just felt so moved to the Lord that I said to that young man, young man, uh, I want you to get the movie on the life of Dr. Ben Carson and watch it. It is. it is, and he. Uh, so I said, "You come back to court next month, and if you have you've you've seen that movie, and you can tell me about it. Now you can't you can't fool me because I've seen it. I know, <laughs> I know about it. So the little fella came back, and he told me about the movie, and uh, I let him go, and I haven't seen him since then. Sometimes those those uh, things help more than than some other things that we can do. So I love my country. I'm red, white, and blue. I love America. I love to go to Washington. Mom and I attended two presidential inaugurations. And so if you would go to Washington in January when it's sleeting and uh, ice on the ground and you walk for blocks, you love your country, don't you, Mama? <laughs> and it's quite an experience. Won't forget it. All right, let's get started. And I will promise you up front that I will only get through about half of my sermon this morning, and I'm going to tell you why. Because uh, because uh, this uh, this scripture this morning has just it has been burning in my heart now for several weeks. I mean, burning, and God has spoken to me personally through uh, the scripture that we're going to look at this morning. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25. We're going to specifically look at verses 14 through um, uh, 14 through 30 this morning. Um, I was in uh, I was in Mary and I went right a the other day, and uh, she was looking for something, and I was just fiddling around waiting on her. And I'm in one aisle, and I heard this guy in. In the joint, I couldn't see him because the shelves were so high. And I heard this guy on his cell telephone, and he said, uh, I think he was talking to his wife. He said, I can hear you, but I'm not listening. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> he said, I can hear you, but I'm not listening. I thought to myself, That's a lot of congregations on Sunday morning. <laughs> They hear, but they don't listen. Uh, I want you to listen this morning. I'm telling you, 
I'm telling you, if you will somehow let the Holy Spirit take hold of your heart and mind, uh, and you will read chapters 24, 25, and 26 of Matthew, you will be transformed, I promise you. Because you see, Jesus is coming down to the end of life's journey. He's facing crucifixion. And it's very interesting that some of the last words that Jesus shares with his disciples and with us. I never look at the Bible simply in terms of Jesus speaking to those people. I try to view the Bible in the sense that he's speaking to my heart also. And if all you see, if all you see is what Jesus said to them then, and you don't understand he's speaking to us now, you miss the real message of the Word of God. Because he's speaking to us. And I don't know of any more, I don't know of any scripture that's any more relevant today than these chapters in Matthew Jesus getting ready for the crucifixion and what are some of the last things he talks about? He talks about his coming back. His coming back. It's relevant, folks. Jesus is coming back again. And it may be very soon. In fact, you read 24, chapter 24, you read some of the things that Jesus talks about is taking place before his return to the earth. And then in chapter 25, Jesus gives three stories, parables, stories. And Jesus talks about the attitude of people who await his coming. And it's one of those stories that I want to share with you this morning. It's the story of the talents. It simply says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway he took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. That was a large sum of money. Likewise, he'd received two, he gained other two, but he that received one went and digged it in the earth and hid the Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoning with them, and then he expects an accounting. If you've read that scripture, and I assure you that you have, the man with the five talents gave a good account of what he had done with the five talents, as did the man with the two talents, but then when he came to the man with one talent, he simply said, I buried it. Now, there's several things. As I said, I'm probably going to only get through about half of this this morning. You see, God gives us many different gifts, right? The first and most important gift God gives us is the gift of salvation. It's a gift from God. Ephesians 2.89 says, For with grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is God's giving to us a gift. And this morning, if you have not received that gift, I could not encourage you more. Open your heart this morning and receive that gift of salvation. Salvation is a result very quickly of the Holy Spirit prodding our hearts to open our hearts and lives and minds and receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. I am so fearful. I've said this many times. I must say it again this morning because you cannot say this enough. There are far, far too many people who have this mistaken idea that you simply quote a sinner's prayer and zippo, you're in the kingdom of heaven. That is, that there is nothing that could be further from the truth. If all one needs to do is simply recite a prayer that someone has given to them and they're in the kingdom of God, folks, and we ought to get on the street corner everywhere we can and simply write out the sinner's prayer. We call it and ha hand it to people and say, read it or pray it or whatever you want to do with it, and you're in the kingdom of God. Far too many people today have that mistaken idea, and unless something changes in their life, they're going to spend eternity in hell. 
you ain't listening. I'm telling you, it's more than simply saying a prayer. And yet there are multitudes of people who have been deluded into believing that salvation, it is a gift. And it's a gift that God gives us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have not received that gift, then I would encourage you this morning to receive that gift. And I would be more than happy to sit down this morning and talk with you about that gift. But let's move beyond that to what our Lord is talking about here. God not only gives us the gift of salvation, when we're born into the kingdom of God, we become children of God. God gives to every single believer various and sundry gifts, and there's no exception. I thought about this this week as this, as this passage just simply burned in my heart. I thought about what if this morning I or any other pastor were to walk through their congregation this morning and point out those who are believers in Christ and simply say to them, would you please tell me this morning what gift did God give you when he saved you? What would be different? Let's do that. very quiet this morning because you see the truth is the truth is that most people who are Christians have not a faint idea of what it means to receive from God a gift or gifts other than salvation Paul especially and I wish I had time to read some of those passages this morning uh, perhaps this week you could read Romans eleven twenty nine, 29 Romans 12 6 1 Timothy 4.14, a few of them. 2 Timothy 1.6, it talks about the gifts. In fact, Paul says to young preacher Timothy, he says, neglect not the gift. And if I were to ask you this morning, what gift or gifts did God give you when he saved you, what would you answer this morning? You see, when I, when I entered the ministry, one of the things that I thought as a young pastor was that I had received from God every gift it was possible for God to give someone and there was nothing that I could not do. That's a terrible mistake. That is a terrible mistake when you feel like you have every gift and you can do everything there is in the church. And friend, I want to tell you something, that will lead to great depression. And you see, we have to learn that God gives to this one one and to that one two and to that one three. But God does give us gifts. And God gives us gifts that, we, that together we might use those gifts to, so that the church of Jesus Christ can function properly, can function in a way that the work of Jesus can be carried out in the community and throughout the world. God's given us gifts. And if you have yet to figure out what, it, what gift is it that God has given to you, I would encourage you to pray, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what it is that God wants you to do within the body of Christ. And I promise you that God wants you to do something. Too many people sitting on our church pews today who simply sit there and they worship and they go home and they wait until next Sunday to return again and nothing happens between this Sunday and that Sunday. God's given you something. But not only does God give us those spiritual gifts, God gives us so many other things. God gives us talents, and so many people misunderstand the fact that talents and gifts are not the same thing. God's given to Denise a great talent. I believe that perhaps in the, in the process of giving Denise that great, that great talent of, of playing the piano, perhaps God has... God has entrusted her also with the gift of encouragement because her music encourages us. Yes, sir. And so we have the talents, but we have the gifts. I tell pulpit, I've told pulpit committees through these 50 years, I do not have the gift of administration. Don't expect me to be an administrator. I am not. I'm a preacher. I'm an encourager. Those are the main gifts that God has given me as a minister of the gospel to preach the word of God, to encourage people to use what God has given to them. 
But God gives us many other things. He gives us a gift. God gives us a talent. And God gives us money. That God expects us to use in the building up of the kingdom of God. One of the things that, and I wish I had time this morning, and I don't because my time is fast running out. I wish this morning I had time to look at that last story that Jesus gave there in Matthew chapter 25. It, I, I, I told Mary, I told Mary this week, as I was studying this one day, I, with tears in my eyes, I said, this portion of God's word literally haunts me sometimes. It haunts me sometimes. What are you talking about, Pastor? When Jesus said the nations are going to be gathered before him, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. He's going to enact judgment, and the judgment's going to be based upon this. I was, I was, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was naked, and you, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and I was sick, and you visited me. And, and uh, we're going to say, but Lord, when did I see you hungry or naked or, naked or, or, or thirsty or, or in prison or sick? And I came unto you, and Jesus is going to say, when you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. That's honing to me. That haunts me sometimes. How many opportunities have I let slip by? Because I did not have time. I did not want to use my resources to help someone. One of the things, and I've said this, I think, before my youngest son, he's, he's a sweet He's a sweet young man. He doesn't drink. He doesn't use drugs. But the only time to my knowledge that he's been in the church in quite a few years has been when he comes to visit his mom. And that isn't often. At least on Sundays. And one of the things that my son has said many times and I, I tend to agree in part with him. He said, our churches have been have strapped themselves so much with debt and building large edifices, they don't have, they don't have the resources to help the needy amongst them. That's a sin under God. It's a sin under God. Because there are the hurting and there are the helpless out here amongst us and it's easy for us to sit in judgment upon those people when we don't even know sometimes the circumstances of their lives. I am what I am this morning by the grace of Almighty God. I could either be in a gutter like my dad or I could be in prison like my dad except for the grace of God. I deal with the worst outcasts of society sometimes. Sometimes I weep and sometimes I share my story of my dad. And I say you don't have to, particularly to young people, I say to them regularly, you can either be like your dad or you can be somebody else. And I tell my story and that's the testimony God's given me. And thank God it's helped some. But folks, they're hurting people out here. They're helpless people out here. And Jesus has said that in part, now that does not mean, and I must say this very, very, very quickly, that does not mean that if you do those things, you're going to inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying if you're a born-again child of God, washed in the blood of Jesus, you're going to do those things. He's not saying that you're going to go to heaven because you do them, but if you're going to heaven, you're going to do those things on earth. Our churches are struggling financially today. There are churches that are on the brink of bankruptcy today. It isn't because God hasn't given his people money. It's because God's people won't use the money in the places they ought to use their money. Here's a gentleman down here, a friend of Bruce. And Bruce invited he and his wife today, and I spoke with him earlier today. He's in the business of raising funds for the Billy Graham organization. He can tell you how hard it is. It's like trying to... It's like trying to work a, work a camel through a needle sometimes. I've been involved in some of that through the years with our Baptist denomination. And people with great sums of money act as if they're going to carry it with them. I've never seen an ambulance, uh, a, I've never seen a hearse carrying a U-Haul trailer behind them, ever. And you won't either. God's given us what he gives us that we might that we might dispense it, we might use it, we might build up the kingdom of God, we might help people. And you, 
could look at me this morning and say, you're just crazy. You won't be the first that has said that, and you won't be the last. But I'm telling you, I don't base this upon what I think. I base it on this book, and that's what this book says. So God gives us gifts, beginning with the gift of salvation. God gives us gifts, and God gives us talents, and God gives us money, and God expects us to use those things. And I can tell you this in closing this morning. Listen to me very carefully. Don't miss this. The master came back one day and said, I want an accountant. You are going to face Almighty God one day in a judgment. Let's suppose. Let's just suppose this morning that uh, you don't know when you're going to meet God. First thing we do in the mornings is Mary gets out her, her laptop and she looks to see if our name's there. And uh, but one day you're going to be in a room with God. And there's going to be a little table there. I want you to imagine this. And in that little room with that little table, there are going to be two chairs, and you're going to sit on one side, and God's going to sit on the other. And God's going to click on his little PC. And God's going to pull your life up there before him. And God's going to say, this is the way it was. This is the way it could have been. Do you have an answer? And when God, God shows you what your life could have been like. You know what you're going to do? You know what you're going to do? That old song, No Tears in Heaven, that is not true gospel. <laughs> because the Bible says God's going to wipe away the last tear from our eyes, and so there's going to be a tear to be wiped away. It's got to be there. As you've heard me say many times, and I hope you can quote it today as well as I can, Dr. Henry Blackaby says, the saddest day in judgment is going to be when God shows us what we could have been. That ought to be haunting to all of us. I think about that regularly. What I could have been had I been obedient to God, had I walked in the ways that he would have me to walk, had I lived in a manner that he wanted me to live. Now close with this. I wasn't sure about it telling these stories whether I should begin with them or whether I should end with them but sometimes people people make the comment now preacher you believe the Bible is really applicable to where we live and I have but one answer to that yes it is I tell you three quick stories to illustrate the truth of the Bible his name was Calvin Calvin was uh, was Down syndrome Never will forget Calvin. Calvin was, I was just a young boy. and Calvin must have been in his maybe 20s or early 30s. He, he lived much longer then than, than normally someone with Down syndrome would live. Calvin had a good mind. He couldn't speak too clearly. He stuttered quite a bit. Calvin was there in that church every time the doors opened. He came. And if you were a member of West End Baptist Church in Rock Hill, and you missed church on Sunday, I can promise you that if Calvin ran into you somewhere in one of the little neighborhood stores or while walking up and down the streets and everybody knew Calvin, Calvin would stop you. And Calvin would say to you, as he stuttered, and I do not do it this way to make light of Calvin because he was a dear, precious child of God. Calvin would say, me, 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 and it may take him a minute to get the rest of that out, but Calvin would say, me, missed you in church Sunday. It said that one time they were having revival at West End and things weren't going so well, and Calvin went up to the preacher that was visiting, preaching, and Calvin said to him, and I'm sure it took him a while to get all of this out. Calvin said, uh, Calvin said, is there something I can do? 
Pastor thought, well, what in the world can this little Down syndrome boy do? Pastor found some, some tracks, and he gave them to Calvin, and Calvin began to go up and down the streets of those mill villages, knocking on doors and passing out those tracks and inviting people to revive them. Long story short, can anybody tell me what happened? Revival. <laughs> Calvin was a one talented person. Remember the one talented guy that Jesus spoke of? He was a one talented person. One gifted person. Second person I want to tell, tell you about this morning was a two gifted person. Two gifted. When I went to be pastor at the Poobies Grove Baptist Church in Granite Falls between Lenore and uh, between Lenore and Hickory on 321, there was a gentleman in the church. He was already in his 60s. Some of the men from the church several years earlier had gone by and visited with him and led him to faith in Christ. You know what his job was? He sold bootleg liquor on the banks of the Catawba River in Caldwell County. That's what he did to make a living. He had little education, couldn't read well. You know what happened? You know what happened to him? Got involved in that church. Got involved with some of the men in, in going out on lay-led revival meetings and giving his testimony. And God used that man with little education, an ex-bootlegger. He's too talented guy. He could give his testimony. He could sit down in somebody's home and tell them the plan of salvation led literally hundreds of people to faith in Jesus. Ben Simmons was a too talented. This past week, I was down at uh, Lawrence, Mary and I, at the Martha Frank's Retirement Center. We were celebrating our 30th anniversary. It's a great event. And uh, the life of Miss Martha Franks was rehearsed during that period of time. And I was so blessed and challenged. Any of you know, any of you dear ladies know the name Martha Franks? Two ladies, three. Miss Martha for 41 years served as a missionary to China in some of its most difficult days. Great saint of God. She came back to America, and she was probably, at that time, she was in her late 60s. And you know what most, people, most retired missionaries do in their late 60s when they've served so faithfully in a place like China? They come home. And they sit down. You know what Miss Martha Franks did? Miss Martha Franks said, Lord, what do you want me to do now with the rest of my life? And long story short, God gave her a vision. And I wish I had hours to tell you about her vision. God gave her a vision of building a retirement community for retired missionaries and retired pastors in Lawrence. Her brother built her home on that farm piece of property down near downtown Lawrence. He built her home. When he passed away, she inherited those, I think it was about 11 acres of land. Martha Franks began to go about Lawrence and everywhere she could go, and she collected up glass bottles. And at that time, Lawrence had a recycling center for, for, for glass bottles. She opened a little nonprofit gift shop, and she'd go back to China case and bring back gifts, and ladies volunteered their time. She had very little of resources. Long story short, she convinced South Carolina Baptist we needed to build a home in Lawrence for retired missionaries and pastors. Miss Martha Franks gave the land. She raised three hundred and ten thousand dollars thirty years ago. R wore out four Volkswagens traveling over South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, anywhere God would open a door. Miss Martha Franks went and told about the work in China, but she also told about her burden building that retirement home there in Lawrence. Miss Martha was a five talented. You see, does Miss Martha have any greater reward in heaven than Finn Simmons, who was a two talented man, or my friend Calvin, who was a one talented person? No. You know the you know you you know you know the, the 
the one thing that can said, be said about each of them, you know what it was? They were faithful to use whatever talent or gift God gave them. You know what God expects of you? Use whatever he has given you. There are a lot of people who grow old. I was telling somebody about somebody the other day that I knew, and I said, you know, the older she gets, the more bitter she becomes. That's not my wife, by the way. <laughs> because in that same conversation, I said, the older my wife gets, the sweeter she gets. But some people grow old and get bitter. Some people grow old and get sweet. Some people grow old and sit down. Some people, the older they grow, the more mature they become. And the more committed they become to the work of the kingdom. When is God going to come and demand an accounting of me? I don't know. When is God going to come and demand an accounting of you? I do not know. This I do know. I want to be found faithful. I want him to say to me the same thing he said to those who were faithful. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Bow with me and pray. I love you. But I didn't know I wouldn't be so straight in my preaching. Because you see, there are two things I want. I want, number one, for you to know Jesus. Number two, if you already know Jesus, I want you to live a life of faithfulness so that when he comes, either in the second coming or he comes through the avenue of death, that when you meet him, you will hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over me. Be faithful. And if you haven't been, if you, if, if, you see, it's so easy to let so much else take the place of God in our lives. So easy to be more committed to so many other things than we're committed to the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you something, regardless of whether you're 20 or whether you're 30 or whether you're 80 this morning, most important thing in the world is a right relationship with God through Jesus and a life of faithfulness to whatever God calls you to do. Please be that. Please be that. Please be that. This little prayer book we're going to engage in beginning tomorrow, if you will approach it, permitting the Holy Spirit to guide you through it, when it's all said and done, you'll come to me and say, Pastor, it helped make a difference in my life. I want you to be faithful. I want this church to be everything God wants it to become. I want this church to reach out beyond these four walls into the community and into that community and this community and everywhere God would lead us, feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, giving water to those who are thirsty, clothing those who are naked. And friends, if we'll do that, God will give us more resources than we could ever imagine and God will bless us with his Holy Spirit. And God will send what we all need so desperately, a real revival. Father, thank you. Thank you more than I could thank you this morning for speaking to my heart this week. You challenged me. You made me look at people a little differently than I had looked at them. You led me to see those who are hurting and those who are needy and those who are helpless and hopeless. And I pray that this week, I pray this week that you'll bless me. But I pray more importantly, you'll use me to be a blessing. There's some Lord in this congregation this morning who know not Jesus. Holy Spirit, bring them to that place of decision. And then, Father, some this morning who are Christians who come and sit on Sunday morning and they leave and, and they do nothing else until next Sunday when they come and sit again. Stir their hearts, O oh God. Stir their hearts, O oh God. And I pray this in the name that's above every other name, the precious, blessed, holy name of the Lord Jesus. And it's for his sake I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Greg, come lead us in our closing song. And if you don't have one of these books, I beg you to pick up one this morning before you leave here. In fact, I'll take some to the back to make it easier for you.
sing our hymn of invitation or the closing song? The closing song, Mighty is Our God. So let's stand together and sing.